Before starting this video looking at the career of Kerry Von Erich, I just want to point out that this upload will put more emphasis on the man's in-ring work and accomplishments. I've already spoken in depth about Kerry Von Erich and the unbelievable circumstances that led to the breakdown of the family, and speaking about Kerry Von Erich's life outside the ring would indeed tread over old ground. Of course, it would be impossible to not touch on a few of these subjects during this video, and where needed we will talk about outside factors that had an impact on Kerry's professional career, but the main focus here is to look at Kerry Von Erich in the ring and dig into what made him so popular with fans. So let's get started as we take a look at the wrestling career of the Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Erich. David Von Erich and Kevin Von Erich had been working in World Class Championship Wrestling, then known as NWA Big Time Wrestling, for around two years before Kerry made his debut. World Class was run by Von Erich Patriarch Fritz Von Erich, and the Von Erich boys would be the main babyfaces of the company. Kevin, David and Kerry were not the only Von Erichs who would step into a World Class ring, as Mike Von Erich and Chris Von Erich would also spend time in a wrestling ring. With this in mind, Mike and Chris wouldn't reach the kind of heights that David, Kevin and Kerry did, mainly due to health reasons. Before stepping into the ring, Kerry Von Erich was a standout in high school track and field, eventually becoming a nationally ranked discus thrower while attending the University of Houston. Brothers David and Kerry were already busy with football and pro wrestling, so Kerry took care of younger brothers Mike and Chris while David and Kevin tore it up in the Dallas Sportatorium. Kerry initially had dreams of contending in the Olympics, but he would soon join his brothers in the ring, and the first recorded match we can see for Kerry was on the 14th of August 1978. If Kevin Von Erich was the charismatic pretty boy, and David Von Erich was the hard work rate guy, then Kerry would fall somewhere in between. He had a great look, he had a presence, and he was able to have athletic high energy matches. Kevin and David were already over huge in Dallas, and when Kerry, the modern day warrior, joined his brothers in the ring, the Von Erichs became unstoppable. Triple H said of Kerry Von Erich, When you saw Kerry walk through a curtain to come to the ring, you just knew he was a star. He just had that X factor that none of us can put our finger on what it truly is, but all of the top guys have it. Kerry had a lot of it. A little known fact is that Kerry Von Erich won his very first championship in pro wrestling alongside Bruiser Brody. Kerry and Brody managed to capture the NWA Texas tag titles in July of 1979 in their very first match as a tag team. Kerry and Brody would continue tagging in the months that followed while Kerry continued to represent the Von Erich brothers. Kerry was able to score his first significant singles championship the following year, as in December of 1980, he was able to win the NWA American Heavyweight Championship, defeating Gino Hernandez for the vacant title. Kerry would end up dropping the title to Ken Patera, but he was able to win the title for a second time when he defeated the Masked Superstar, who we all know better as X from Demolition. Kerry would then exchange title wins with Ernie Ladd, another superstar who I'd like to cover in the future. Kerry's big main event push happened in June 4th, 1982. On this date, Former NWA World Champion Harley Race paid Texas a visit for the Fritz Von Erich Retirement Show. On this event, that also featured appearances from Andre the Giant and King Kong Bundy, Harley worked a match against Kerry Von Erich, and Kerry was able to score a pinfall victory over the former champ. It was agreed by the committee that Kerry Von Erich would work against NWA Champion Ric Flair in the months that followed, with Ric stopping off at World Class in August of 1982 to defend his title against Kerry at the Wrestling Star Wars event. Flair defeated Kerry in a 2 out of 3 falls match that went over half an hour. Flair vs Kerry Von Erich happened two more times before the end of 1982, with the modern day warrior coming up short on both occasions. 
Their last match of 82 though, at the Christmas Star Wars event, kickstarted the famous Freebirds vs Von Erich feud. Michael Hayes was the referee for this match, and when Kerry refused the Freebirds help in becoming NWA champion, Terry Gordy slammed the steel cage door on Kerry's head, letting Flair pick up the win and thus the historic feud had started. The Freebirds vs the Von Erichs rivalry went on for around 5 years, with many fans and people involved in the business, such as Stone Cold Steve Austin, naming this the greatest feud in the history of professional wrestling. With this in mind, I feel this video shifting into Von Erich family territory, so let's refocus back on Kerry. May 6th 1984 would be the date of Kerry Von Erich's biggest ever title win, probably the most important match in the man's career. The David Von Erich Memorial Parade of Champions was held on this date, a tribute show for David who had passed away 3 months earlier. In the main event of this show, Nature Boy Ric Flair would be defending the NWA World Heavyweight Championship against Kerry Von Erich. Around 45,000 fans had turned up to pay tribute to David, and in the process, this record crowd also saw Kerry defeat Flair for the NWA World Title. It's a very special match that does come recommended, the whole thing feels like the end of a movie where after unspeakable events, there's this light at the end of the tunnel. Kevin Von Erich said of the match, I'll never forget it, we ran over to Kerry and jumped on him. It was a great day and I had 45,000 friends there to share it with too. The moment Kerry Von Erich won the NWA Championship was huge without a doubt, but Flair has stated in his autobiography that Kerry was having substance problems, even in this point of his career. Flair said that Kerry would come to the ring and forget to tie his boots, he would forget spots that he and Flair spoke about just 10 minutes before bell time, and Kerry would leave the ring in the middle of matches to go and chat up female fans at ringside. David was always the Von Erich that the NWA and indeed Ric Flair saw as the potential future NWA champion. Plans of course changed when David passed away, but this doesn't mean that the committee would be giving Kerry a long title run here, far from it. The NWA was smart enough to give Kerry the title here when emotions were high and record crowds had flocked to the Texas Stadium, but as it would turn out, Kerry only held the title for 18 days before dropping the belt back to Ric Flair. Jerry Lawler spoke of Kerry's title reign, saying, I really thought this would be the start of a new era. I really thought that this was Ric Flair passing the torch to Kerry, and I thought Kerry would be a long-term champion. I think Kerry was a great performer and a great wrestler, but not a good businessman. It's not just about going out on television, signing autographs, having great matches and holding the belt up. There's also responsibilities that go with that. First and foremost, you need to be reliable and make your bookings. I think that cost him a long term title reign. You can't risk booking the NWA champion and he doesn't show up. With this previous quote in mind, during his time as NWA champion, Kerry Von Erich had 16 bookings in 18 days. He made it to every single match. As the Von Erichs ended their feud with the Freebirds, Kerry got involved in a feud with gentleman Chris Adams. From here, Kerry got another shot at the NWA Championship when he had a rematch with Ric Flair on Christmas Day in 1984, however Flair got himself DQ'd in this match. This brings us then to the motorcycle accident that eventually led to Kerry having his foot amputated. This is something I don't want to linger on too much in this video, I had already done that in the Von Erich family upload, but just to cover it briefly, on June 4th 1986, Kerry was riding his motorcycle around his home in Texas without a helmet or any protective clothing. Kerry was involved in an accident and he had surgery on his right leg but when he got home he tried to walk prematurely which caused more damage, leading to doctors being unable to save his right foot. 
Carey somehow continued to wrestle without his right foot for the remainder of his career. In all honesty, it's impossible to tell, which has led many to believe that the story just isn't true. It's up for you to decide, but many superstars over the years, including the likes of Roddy Piper and Bret Hart, have confirmed the story. There's also a story out there that the secret was exposed during an AWA taping in Las Vegas, Nevada. During the match, Carey's boot came off and he had to dash out of the ring and hide his leg under the ring apron as he tried to put his footwear back on. All you really need to know though are the facts. The motorcycle incident did happen and it led to Carey developing even more dependencies on medication. As the years went on, Vince McMahon and the WWF began eating up territories and raiding the top stars. World Class was not the company it once was, but the territory didn't go down without a fight. During this time, the AWA held events named Super Clash, with these particular events featuring superstars from many different promotions coming together to make supercards. Super Clash 3 featured World Class Champion Kerry Von Erich taking on AWA Heavyweight Champion Jerry the King Lawler in a unification match. Jerry Lawler won the showdown due to a referee stoppage, making him the undisputed World Champion. Super Clash 3, however, wasn't a success. This was the AWA's first pay-per-view presentation and Vern Gagne didn't pay talent due to the low buy rates. This led to what many believe was the beginning of the end for the AWA. Wrestlers wouldn't work for Vern going forward and Vern took out his frustrations on live TV on those who called him out. A prime example being that Jerry Lawler was stripped of the Undisputed Championship on AWA television and verbally buried by Vern. Super Clash 3 is available on the WWE Network and it's worth a watch just out of sheer curiosity. Lawler vs Von Erich though, in my opinion, was very very good. Jerry Jarrett became the majority owner of World Class and the company was rebranded as the USWA. The tradition of world class was gone in a short period of time, which really was a shame. Of all the old territories out there, I do enjoy watching world class more than others. The AWA had some huge superstars coming in and out of the promotion, but that Freebirds vs Von Erich rivalry was absolute fire in world class. World Class also had a great presentation style that I enjoyed too. The Dallas Sportatorium had a great feel to it. But anyway, Kerry continued working in the USWA, forming a tag team with Jeff Jarrett and also picking up the Texas Heavyweight title twice. After feuding with Matt Bourne, Kerry Von Erich abruptly left the USWA and joined Vince McMahon's World Wrestling Federation in 1990. Kerry would become the Texas Tornado in the WWF and upon his TV debut, he got a huge welcome from WWE audiences. He looked like a superstar upon his first entrance at Saturday night's main event on July 16th 1990, going on to defeat Buddy Rose in the main event. Kerry had the look that the WWF went for, you can see it here for yourself. The guy looked like a million dollars by the time he was in the World Wrestling Federation. In the weeks following his debut, the Texas Tornado teamed up with the Ultimate Warrior on the house show loop, mainly working against Heenan family members Mr. Perfect and Ravishing Rick Rude. Those in attendance at these house shows from August of 1990 should hold on to these memories. What a great combination of wrestlers in a single match. Luckily, there was a recording of one of these house show matches on the 8th of August and the entire match is available on YouTube. Just one month after his debut, the Texas Tornado substituted for Brutus Beefcake in SummerSlam 1990 to face Mr. Perfect for the Intercontinental title. Kerry was victorious and again, you can see how popular he really was once he gets the pinfall win here. As always, credit has to be given to Kurt Hennig, he sold like an absolute champion during this title match. Getting the IC title during this era in the World Wrestling Federation shouldn't be something we overlook either, especially in such a quick space of time. Kerry held on to the title for around 3 months before dropping the belt back to Kurt Hennig. 
The Texas Tornado and Mr. Perfect would continue to work together on house shows right up until the end of the year. His Survivor Series team, consisting of the Road Warriors, the Ultimate Warrior and Kerry, defeated Demolition and Mr. Perfect at the 1990 Survivor Series in an entertaining match. Throughout early 1991, Kerry worked against Ted DiBiase on the house show loop, the man who effectively cost him his IC title. The Texas Tornado then made his WrestleMania debut at WrestleMania 7, defeating Dino Bravo in around 3 minutes. And around a week after WrestleMania, Kerry and Mr. Perfect worked against each other once again at SWS WrestleFest at the Tokyo Dome. Kerry's WWF push continued during the first half of 1991. He didn't once receive a pinfall loss until the Warlord defeated him in August. In October, Von Erich was able to work once again with nature boy Ric Flair, who had just come over to the WWF along with his real world title. However, every recorded match we have featuring the Texas Tornado vs Ric Flair sees Kerry taking the loss. With that being said, Kerry continued picking up wins after this short Flair feud. Kerry was also able to take part in the 1992 Royal Rumble, one of my favourite Royal Rumble matches where the winner would receive the WWF Championship. Ironically enough, Ric Flair eliminated Kerry from the match. The end of Kerry's run came in August of 1992. In the weeks leading up to his departure, he was putting Kamala over at house shows as it seemed that the WWF had no further use for Kerry Von Erich. The wins he did receive before this were mostly against lower talent in the opening matches at events. After his WWF stint ended, Kerry worked in wrestle and romance in Japan and also went back to the Dallas Sportatorium to work in the GWF. His last match saw him team up with Chris Adams to take on Black Bart and Johnny Mantel. Kerry Von Erich got in trouble with the law over the years. His most recent incident would have possibly led to some time behind bars, something that Kerry felt he couldn't face. Along with this, his marriage was falling apart and the sad circumstances that had plagued the Von Erich family were always on his mind. On February 18th, 1993, Kerry felt he couldn't go on, and he ended it all with a single gunshot to the heart. Kerry was only 33 years old. Jim Cornette said, He put himself in some bad positions and he was maybe fixing to go to jail, with some things going out to the public that you wouldn't want going out about yourself. In my opinion, he was still so young that he could have got straightened up and came back a few years later, bigger and better than ever, and all probably would have been forgotten. He couldn't see it at that time. 